Okay, so we're going to be, um, as I said, I can't believe this is number 12 of these second Sunday sermons. So for a year now, every second Sunday, either I've been teaching or we had a couple of weeks when Doug taught us, did a great job talking about the flood and then the Tower of Babel. So Monday of this past week, I uh, went to see my daughter Melissa because her car battery was dead. God used that to get me to be with her at lunchtime because as we were talking, he showed me what he wanted me to talk about this week. I just love divine appointments. You don't, you're not, you don't even know our divine appointments. But we were talking about heaven and how there are so many misconceptions of it and how the world looks at heaven one way and how the Bible clearly looks at it another way. And a lot of stuff is not in the Bible about heaven. Believe it, and how do you know it's not in there? If it's not there, how do you know it's not there? Because it tells us it's not. But we'll get to all that. So we're going to look at heaven today. So if you want to turn, if you have a Bible with you, uh, a lot of the stuff, cleverly enough, is in the book of Revelation. So if you want to turn to uh, chapter 4, then um, we can start there. But initially, I want to read this little, it's basically a joke. So once upon a time, there was a man named Joe. One day he died and found himself standing in front of the pearly gates. Well, St. Peter said to him, Joe, if you can answer one question, I'll let you into heaven. Well, Joe said, sounds easy enough. So St. Peter said, okay, here it is. Who's with you always? And Joe answered right away, oh, that's easy, Andy. Very surprised and a little confused, Peter said, Andy? And Joe replied, yeah, haven't you heard that hymn? Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. <laughs> it's a dad joke alert. <laughs> but I did tell that joke because many people have very interesting ideas about what heaven will be like and, and what even entrance into heaven is going to be like. So what will it be like? Who will be there? What are the entrance requirements? Uh, what will we do? when we get there. So I'm hoping after today's message, everyone here will have a clearer understanding of this wonderful, amazing place that is promised to every believer. So because of all the confusion surrounding heaven, I call this message not just heaven. That's the next slide. Oh, that's the other thing I didn't cover was in the bulletin. So <laughs> when we all get to heaven, yes, I'm sorry. You're doing fine. That's my fault. Okay, there it is. Not just heaven, but heavenly days. That's what I'm calling it. Spelled cleverly enough. So as I said, you wouldn't be surprised to find out that there are a lot of scriptures about heaven in the book of Revelation. So we'll spend a lot of time there. So, as I said, you turn to Revelation 4. So the first question I have is, what will heaven be like? Well, I probably don't have to tell you there are a lot of ideas floating around about what heaven will be like. I have a slide that shows you the idea that a lot of people have that heaven will be like. There are people that believe we'll be sitting on clouds and just playing a little harp for eternity. Just broom, broom, and maybe broom, and then broom, and then broom. I, I guess we'd get pretty good after billions of years. <laughs> but I have another slide that clears that up, <clears throat> as the game shows would say. I think it's safe to say that that idea is what I would call a misconception. So where does the idea of playing harps come from? Did someone just pick that out of the air? Well, no, I'm glad you asked. The book of Revelation tells us about it, starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. After these things I looked, what things? Well, just a very short thing. Jesus said in chapter 1, verse 19, to John, write the things that you have seen, the things which are, and the things that will come after this. The things that he saw was revealed Jesus in chapter 1. The things that are, that are, are the church age, chapters 2 and 3, and the things that will come after this is everything that happens after what I call, the Bible calls, um, through different translations. You won't find the word rapture, but the rapture happens at the beginning of chapter 4, Meta tauta, after this. That's at the end of verse 19 in chapter 1, and now it's talking about it here. So this is after the church age. So this, even chapter 4, verse 1, is in the future for us. Because we're still here. 
After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. Paul says it's going to be at the last trumpet that we get taken. Speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after this. So immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones. And on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting there, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. So, anyway, who are these 24 elders? Well, angels are often pictured in Scripture as wearing white robes. And it says here they were wearing white robes. But Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. So these elders are also wearing crowns of gold on their heads. White robes and crowns on their heads. Now, Scripture doesn't say anywhere. They say that angels wear white robes, but it never says that they wear a crown. And then 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4 says, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So the 24 elders, I believe, are people. They're us. They're believers in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now, Revelation 5, 8, here comes the harp part. It's a lot of lead-in for this, right? Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So, it's biblical for us to have harps in heaven, but it doesn't say we're going to sit on a cloud and play them for all of eternity, okay? So, I'm pretty sure that's a misconception. Now, how else is heaven described? Well, a lot, but in the same book of Revelation, if you want to turn to chapter 21, that would be toward the back more. <laughs> just, just to, you know, it's my job to direct you. We'll start in verse 1 of chapter 21. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. Does that sound familiar from when he was on the cross? Very familiar, very close. It is finished, yeah. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So this gives us a pretty good picture right there of what heaven is going to be like. Skipping down to verse 9, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she also had a great and high wall with twelve gates, with twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, we don't even have to guess who they are, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, 
three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are all equal. Which basically works out to about 1,400 to 1,500 miles long, wide, and tall. 1,500. That's like halfway across the United States of America. That's a big city, <laughs> wouldn't you say? Uh, you can say yes. He knows. It's true. Okay. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony. Chal I'll go on. The fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, syrophrase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. Can you imagine a pearl? As I like to say, what size oyster did that pearl come out of? I don't know if it was made the same way. God can make anything that he wants anyway. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I just got to inject this. It's so cool to me that one of the most precious things on earth to people is gold. We have perverted the golden rule, right? We say, he who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, God says, you like gold a lot? Well, I'm just going to make pavement out of it. That's how worthless to me gold is compared to my being, the fact that I'm God. You're going to be walking on golden streets, but they're also transparent glass golden streets. How that works, I'm not sure, but it's what it says. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Verse 23 the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb, Jesus, is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there's no night there, so they'll never be shut. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So, what will heaven be like? All I put in my notes is amazing. Right? It's going to be so amazing. Now, the next question. Who will be there? Well, I think a lot of people on planet Earth would like to say good people. You only, want, you only think good people would go there, right? Well, John Corson has a great answer for that. When people say, why do bad things happen to good people? He says, I know. There are no good people. which may sound kind of rude to some of us. But if you look at the Bible, it says a lot about our goodness or goodness, our lack thereof. Romans 3, 10 through 12. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There was none who does good. No, not one. So when I say that none of us is good, I'm not being mean. I'm not being rude. I'm saying what the Bible says. Now this does not mean you can't do good things. It just means you're not good. <laughs> it just means at the core of your being, you're sinful. I'm sinful. All of us are sinful. We have need of a Savior. We cannot get to heaven on our own. So if none of us is good, how do we stand a chance? Well, we don't. On our own. But there is one way. One name. Jesus. Acts 4.12, Peter said, Nor is there salvation in any other, speaking of Jesus, 
For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And when we're saved, this is what happens to us. Revelation 21-27. Only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life get into heaven. Now, How does that happen? How do we get written into the Lamb's book of life? Well, John 3.16 tells us. Pretty famous verse. Jesus Himself said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish. Perish means eternity separated from God in the lake of fire. He doesn't want that to happen. If you just believe in Him, trust in Him, make Him your Savior and Lord, you'll have everlasting life. And just to make sure that there's nothing you can do to earn it, nothing you can do to achieve salvation on your own, no goodness you can do. Romans 10.9 If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, in other words, the Lordship of Jesus in your life, if you make Him your Savior and your Lord, and there is one caveat. You knew it. There's something you got to do, right? You got to believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. You really do have to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. It, it's kind of a sticking point with God. He went through all that. He's like, you can at least believe in that. <laughs> it did happen. You will be saved. Confess that Jesus is your Lord. Believe that God raised Him from the dead. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Every sin you've done is, is eradicated, is paid for, is forgiven. There's a five-letter word for that. It's called grace. <laughs> and there's another one that ties in with it. It's called mercy, that He doesn't hold sin against you. So who will be there? Anyone who is a believer in Jesus. I have a slide that I love. It's so cool. I love this. She's hugging Jesus in heaven. And I have a feeling that we all get to do that. I don't think it's going to be a group hug. <laughs> I mean, you've got eternity, right? You've got a lot of time. <laughs> but I think we're all going to get welcomed by Him. He's welcoming a believer to heaven. And it reminds me of something else that I almost left out. One more important thing. One more thing about who will be there. God! <laughs> God is going to be in heaven. And do you know that Revelation 22, verse 4 says something is so incredible to me. They, speaking of anyone who gets there, because of what Jesus did and their acceptance of it, they shall see His face. Now this is an artist rendering. No, not that one. Back up. <laughs> Sorry, I, I made it sound like I was changing slides. This is an artist rendering, and I think if you look closely on the wrist, you see the nail print. Of, on Jesus' wrist there, where we would have been nailed to the cross. But there's no guarantee that he looked like that. I don't know. I think he looks a little more Jewish there than a lot of movies where he's a white British actor with an accent, an English accent. Why they speak in an English... That's one of the things I appreciate about Passion of the Christ. At least he used the language of the day. Pretty close is a dead language. It's pretty hard to tell. But they shall see his face. So... The Bible says who st states who will be there. Does it state who won't be there? Well, again, Revelation 21, verse 8 and then verse 27. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And verse 27 says but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. Now, I tend to believe this is not a complete list. You could put cheaters on there. You could put unregenerate people, rejectors of Jesus. That's what all these people are. Now, in this room, we may have cowards. We may have people that at one time un were unbelievers. People who were abominable. I hope no murderers, but maybe murderers in the heart. As Jesus says, you're so mad at someone you could have done it. Sexually immoral. Some people dealing with sorcery, which is really witchcraft. Uh, maybe drug use. Idolaters. You see what I'm saying? We're all sinners. So how can we get in and they don't? It's Jesus. 
That's the difference. We've accepted and acknowledged that we're sinners and we need a Savior. If you're a Christian, you have. And those people have rejected Jesus. I think it's safe to say all these people have one thing in common. They did not live their lives for Jesus. They never made Him their Savior and Lord. They weren't comfortable around Christians and they won't be comfortable around Jesus either. So, it's sad, but God honors their desire to be separate from Him. Because really, God's a gentleman and He will never violate anyone's free will. See, there's this strange thing that there's God's sovereignty, meaning what He says goes. He knows what's going to happen. And right in the mixed midst of all that, I believe Scripture teaches that we have free will. I think it's the strangest thing that the object of the love of God, the greatest object of His love is you, and the greatest chance of that object rejecting Him lies right within you, and that's your heart. See, God has to deal with the human heart, and the human heart has to yield to Him and has to say, you know what? I've seen everything else in this world that's, that's pretty appealing, I'll agree, but a lot of it's empty. You're not. You fulfill me, so I want you. That's what the human heart does to get into heaven. Just accepts Jesus and just keeps learning about him. It's like, whoa, there's so much to know. This is awesome. And the more you know, really, I think the more you love him and the more you appreciate him, which makes your faith even stronger and you keep growing. And yet, I've been at it, let's see, 50 years or so, 40 to 50 years of serious love of God and I've got a long way to go. <laughs> it just never stops. But these people just think it's all nonsense. And so he says, well, if you, if you think it's nonsense, I'm not going to make you go to heaven. You won't even be happy there. Revelation 20, verse 15 tells us one of the saddest verses in the Bible. What happens to those who reject Him? And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And this is when that slide comes up. The next one. This is in the Sistine Chapel, and I had the great fortune of actually being able to go there and see it one time. And this is painted, he painted the ceiling first, and then he came back and they commissioned him to paint above the altar, and that's where this one is. This isn't actually on the ceiling. It's painted by Michelangelo, and what it's known is as the condemned sinner. And if you look, he's covered one eye, but the other eye is so dark, and yet doesn't it look hollow? I mean, the, the expression, he just realizes he's in big trouble. He really is. He's realized two things. Number one, he's condemned to the lake of fire for eternity. And number two, it's his fault because he rejected Jesus his whole life. And now it's too late. So that's who's not going to be in heaven. But who will be there? God, who is the one who makes heaven heaven. I mean, it could be a dirt road, and it could be shacks and run-down places, but if God were there, it would be awesome. But just because He can, He makes this amazing city for us to live in. So God will be there, and anyone who wants to be with the Lord forever. In other words, any believer in Jesus. Okay, so question number three. What will we be like in heaven? Well, I have a slide of a lot of people today, when they get there, most of the new arrivals seem incapable of conversation. They just stare at their hands in despair. Because their cell phones and iPads have been removed, they didn't get raptured or go, they didn't bury them with them, I guess. But uh. <laughs> So first of all, what will we be like in heaven? We will be alive. And I say that because Jesus Himself said in Mark 12, 26 and 27, but concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am, present tense, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. All Genesis characters, and now we're in the book of Exodus. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. So we'll be alive in heaven, okay? That's one of the things that sounds weird, but when you die is when you really start living. 
So, will we recognize anyone in heaven? Some people want to know that. Matthew 8, verse 11, Jesus said, And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 17, verse 3, when Jesus is transfigured, Matthew tells us, Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. That's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and Elijah. All mentioned there as being alive and being there. Now, even after Moses and Elijah had been dead for centuries, they appeared with Jesus on the Transfiguration Mount when he changed his appearance and shined like the sun and outshined the sun. And as one commentator said, it's, I love it, he says, people say, how was he able to change his appearance and look like that? He says, hey, the big key is, how was he able to hide that the rest of the time he was here? Because <laughs> that's who he is. He's glorious. But anyway, after, after they were dead for centuries, Peter, James, and John recognized Moses and Elijah. Now, I'm not sure how. I don't know if they had those little things you have at corporate things. Hi, my name is Moses. My name is Elijah. Good to see you. I don't know, but they know. Probably the Holy Spirit actually did it. But that means, listen to this list, just a very small one. In heaven, we will recognize and be able to have fellowship with Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Samuel, Moses, Joshua, Esther, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, David, Peter, Barnabas, Paul, and even Thomas. Remember, Thomas is a big deal. Don't doubt it for a second. You're going to be able to have fellowship with Thomas. There's another little dad joke for a second there. Don't doubt that you'll be with Thomas. I'm going to keep saying it until you at least nod. <laughs> I like what Pastor Chuck used to say about this. Do you think we'll be dumber in heaven than we are here? <laughs> no, I don't think so either. I think we'll recognize other believers. And you know what's really fascinating to me? These people, if, if you like your Bible at all, if you love the Lord, these people are kind of heroes to us. Like, wow, look. I mean, they were heroes to the, the Pharisees and the Jews, right? The leaders. Abraham, our father Abraham, right? Our great leader Moses and the God of Jacob and Isaac. Just wonderful stuff. I have a feeling they're going to be excited to talk to you too. Isn't that amazing? We're just like, we're just regular guys. <laughs> I don't think that, I just, I don't want to talk about me. I want to hear from you. And he's like, yeah, but, but you lived in the day of a cell phone. How did you spend time with God when you had that thing to distract you? Well, I didn't always. Yeah, well, you know, I didn't always either. So then you can compare notes, whatever. It's just going to be amazing to actually meet these people. And I really do believe that they will be just as excited to meet us. You know why? Because we're all grace cadets. <laughs> and that's how we get there. And what about family members? Are we going to know family at all? Well, I know it's in the midst of a very tragic situation I'm going to read from about David and Bathsheba and how he committed adultery with her and then she got pregnant. Well, excuse me, they got pregnant because <laughs> David was involved. And so he ended up having Uriah killed. I'm very much shortening the story. But eventually, he thought it was okay, and then the baby got sick after it was born, and eventually it died. So, he decided to go worship God after um, the baby had died. So they come to him and say, what are you doing? You should have been worshiping then and, and praying now or mourning now. And he says, well, hey, while the child was alive, this is in 2 Samuel 12, 22 and 23. While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now... He's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. David had a clear understanding. I'm going to see him again in heaven. And with all the people there, somehow I'm going to know my son. So I firmly believe we're going to know our family members. And you know, my immediate family, I'm going to see again my dad, my mom, my oldest brother and sister, all of them have died, gone on ahead of me to heaven. And I'm so excited about that. You know, one of the things that, that means a lot to me in the Bible when I read about, he's the God of my father, I could say the same thing. Not everybody can, and I'm not saying that I'm better than anybody else, but it's just when I read that, I think, hey, me too. <laughs> he's the God of my father. That's kind of fun. So anyway, what else does the Bible say about what we'll be like in heaven? Well, I already read Revelation 21.4 and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. 
there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. It doesn't say God's going to dry up your tears like he gets out a leaf blower and goes, and your face is dried off. He's going to wipe them away. That's personal attention. It's amazing. So without sin, there are other things that believers will not find in heaven. How about this? Listen to this list. I love this. No more sickness. No more fear. No more stress. No more depression. No more sleepless nights. No more anxiety. No more abuse. No more heartaches. No more divorce. No more racism. No more injustices. No more violence. All that's gone. You know why all that's gone? Because all that's rooted in sin. Sin will be gone. So cool. It's going to be so great. And another scripture about what we'll be like in heaven is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57. And Paul wrote, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. In other words, our bodies the way they are now cannot go to heaven. We wouldn't make it. We wouldn't survive. And we're corrupted, and we're corruptible, and we also do corrupting of other people, unfortunately. So our bodies and our natures have to change. Behold, I tell you a mystery, which means not like an Agatha Christie book or a murder mystery, but a hidden truth that was unrevealed until right when Paul revealed it there. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And I love this joke because that's a great verse to put up in a nursery at a church. Well, not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. But anyway, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm really looking forward to the new body deal. <laughs> I get up and it's like, what's that cereal? Um, Rice Krispies. Snap, crackle, pop. <laughs> I'll think, oh, my back kind of hurts. So I'm very fortunate. Most of the time I can self-adjust my back. I don't have to visit chiropractors too often. But I'll go like on a wooden floor and it just echoes through the house. It's like, wow. And my my dad, I remember him walking down the hall when I was a little kid. Um, It just was like castanets. (laughs) All the bones and creaks. And my knee, I've had surgery. I've gone over that ad nauseum with you guys. It'll just be nice to have a body that's better suited to live in heaven for eternity. We will be corruptible. Or, excuse me. We already are. We will be incorruptible and immortal with a brand new body made for life in heaven. And Randy Alcorn, I'll sum up this section with this great quote. He says, you will be you in heaven. Who else would you be if Bob, a man on earth, is no longer Bob when he gets to heaven Then, in fact Bob did not go to heaven? If you're not Bob on he- in heaven that y- and you were Bob on earth, you wouldn't be Bob going to heaven. So our individuality somehow remains. So, you ready for this? What will we be like in heaven? The same and vastly different, but definitely better. Okay, I have a slide for number four. Is St. Peter at the gates? This is a common question. And does St. Peter hand out these? I've got two tickets to paradise. Sorry, I won't sing anymore. Um, (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) So there's an idea that people have that St. Peter is at the gates. Where did that come from? Well, in Matthew 16, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they give him the different answers that men say. Some say Moses, some say Elijah, some say this, some say that. Then Jesus says directly, who do you say that I am? Which is a question that every person needs to answer. In verses 16 through 19, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. It means, means son of Jonah. For flesh and blood is not revealed this to you. In other words, nobody told you that. No person. But my Father who is in heaven is the one who revealed it to him. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, which, by the way, means little stone. It doesn't mean rock of Gibraltar, okay? <laughs> and what it is, it's his confession of who Jesus is, is what Jesus bases his church on. Not Peter. I'm going to say this literally. God forbid that he builds his church on any person because we would mess it up. That's why denominations start off great because they're built on God and then if, we, if God waits another couple hundred years, Calvary chapels would be just as messed up as a lot of denominations are today because we'll get farther and farther away from what started it and a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit will have to come and another few churches will rise. It's just what happens. So anyway, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So, here he says, I'm giving you the keys to heaven, Peter. So they assume he's the only one that has that. Peter's the only one that has it. What's the key to heaven? Believing in Jesus, right? But because Peter, people see Peter has the keys, then he must be the gatekeeper, so we better put him at a little podium like we had in that drawing, and he's checking through the book and determining whether or not you get into heaven. We've already seen that Peter has nothing to do with entrance to heaven. John 14, 6, written on the wall behind me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is Jesus himself talking. And the part that isn't up there, no one comes to the Father except through me. And as I like to say it, it's not like Jesus is God's bouncer and he's like, you want to get to the Father? You've got to get through me. <laughs> you know, it's not that. It's by way of. I'll introduce you to him. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We're one. It's all about Jesus and what? His finished work on the cross. No mention of St. Peter. I think Peter is an awesome guy. Don't get me wrong. It's just that Jesus is the only way to heaven. So, is St. Peter at the gates? Maybe. But if he is, he's probably just a greeter. <laughs> okay? He's not the one who lets you in. And the fifth point. What will we do when we get there? Well, I have a slide, a far side cartoon, one of my favorites. It says, wish I'd brought a magazine. Just sitting there, which is a, it's, it's such a brilliant cartoon because you have eternity. Do you think you'd in no time at all memorize that magazine? <laughs> Maybe I wish I'd subscribed to a magazine. <laughs> Maybe it would be better. It's just so funny. Maybe p many people think that life here on earth is great. And therefore, eternal life in heaven must be what the next slide says. Boring. Sitting there. On a cloud. See, he, he's put the harp down. I'm done with that. That's it. I, I'm tired of that. I mean, it's only four strings. How many notes can you play, right? <laughs> Not even any frets. I don't know what you could do to change a tune. Bing, 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 bing. I'm just going to tell you this right now. From what I've seen in Scripture, heaven will not be boring. No. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, you, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Does that sound boring? Fullness of joy? Anybody here, have we ever had fullness of joy? Maybe at your baptism, maybe at your conversion, maybe at a baby being born. You get fullness of joy. Does it last? No, but just being in the presence of God, you have fullness of joy that is eternal. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 21 in the parable, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So I want you to remember this. Before sin came into the world in the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam work to do. He did. Work was not a part of the curse. Adam was told to go to work the ground and have dominion over the animals from the very beginning. After sin entered the world, though, the curse brought suffering and toil and fruitlessness that now makes our work, well, work. <laughs> right? I heard about a little boy who was pretty scripturally intelligent, biblically based, and he was pulling out weeds and he says, stupid serpent. 
hate that gun, you know. <laughs> Not for him. Wouldn't have sinned. Wouldn't be weeds in the place. I love that. But work itself is a sanctified, God-given directive. And do you know that we'll have work to do in heaven? Now, I don't think it'll be like, oh, man, tomorrow's Monday. And we're like, oh, I don't know if I can even get out of bed, punch that time clock. You know what God's like? You've got to be on time. <laughs> because <laughs> we've all heard it. he's never early and he's never late he's always right on time that god guy whoa and and how many of us are going to be in heaven like i hate my job i remember talking to my sister when i was a plumber and i was just i was working for what i thought was the best company in boise i was excelling i was doing great i was being paid well she says you are one of the luckiest people on planet earth most people hate their jobs and now look at the job i got i mean i I got a pretty demanding boss, but boy, he comes through for me every week. I <laughs> love this guy. I really do. There'll be work for us to do in heaven, though. It won't be that type of job. Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10. There are these four living creatures in heaven and the 24 elders. They respond in song by singing to the Lamb who was worthy to open the scroll. It's basically, I believe, there are some interpretations, but there's a scroll in, in chapter 5 that can't be opened by anyone because no one's worthy. A lot of people want to open it, but no one's worthy to open it. And so John starts crying, and he says, wait, look, there's a lamb. He's worthy. And he looked, and he saw a lamb that looked as though it had been slain. It's Jesus is the one who's worthy. So a lot of people think it's the title deed to the earth, which we had, and we gave it to Satan in the Garden of Eden. And so only Jesus can open that, that scroll. But anyway, this is what they say. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Well, who else is that? It's got to be Jesus he's talking about. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us, what? Kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Does that sound like we have nothing to do in heaven? We'll be reigning on the planet. Now wait a minute, I thought we are going to be in heaven. We've got to come back to earth? Well, Revelation 21, verse 1, we read it earlier. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there's a discrepancy among scholars if it's a brand new place or if it's just renewed. Either way, it would be a great place to be. Eventually, eternity will be on the new earth and we will reign with Jesus. So we'll have things to do. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19 describes a good situation, something else for us to do. But we, one we won't fully realize, I think, until we're in heaven. It says that we, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I think only in heaven can we completely do that. So in other words, we'll learn things about God when we get to heaven. The Apostle Paul was most likely wrote about his own experience in heaven. Um, he was stoned to death, dragged out of the city, and while they're praying, he got taken up to heaven. This, I, this is maybe only a personal belief, not only me, but a lot of scholars believe it. I'm not lumping myself in scholars, but I believe that he got taken to heaven. And then when he came back, God says, okay, he, sh he showed him things. He had him hear things. Then he sent him back to his body. Paul got up because what did Paul do? He went right back into the city where the people had stoned him. They're like, didn't we just kill that guy? I, I, look, they're the, look at, they're the marks in the ground where we dragged him. And he's walking in here. How could Paul be bold enough to go in there? Because he saw heaven. He says, if that's where we're going to wind up, I can face anything. I can stare down anybody. No big deal. That's how awesome heaven is going to be. And what does Paul write about? He says, he was caught up into paradise and he heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. What he heard, he was not even able to write down and tell us about. That's in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14. But with all that going on, we also, I believe, will maintain our individuality. God created us as individuals and He will allow us within the confines of sinless perfection to be ourselves. So, wrapping up these five points, in closing, whatever you think about heaven, it's going to be 
better. Whatever I think about heaven, it's going to be better. Because no eye has ever seen it. It's certainly not that it's alive today. I, don't, I, know, I know people have said they've died temporarily or whatever and gone to heaven. I'm not going to get into a dispute over that because God's God, and I believe he took Paul there. So he could have taken other people. But basically, the general public, no eye has seen it. No mind has even conceived in their brains what God has prepared for those who love him. And then Charles Spurgeon, I'll read two quotes, one by Charles Spurgeon, one by a man named Onyx Torres. But he says, Spurgeon said, it is very little that we can know of the future state, but we may be quite sure that what we know as much as, excuse, excuse me, what we know as much as is good for us. We ought to be as content with that which is not revealed as that which is. If God wills us not to know, we ought to be satisfied not to know. Depend on it. He has told us all about heaven that is necessary to bring us there. And if he had revealed more, it would have served rather for the gratification of our curiosity than for the increase of our grace. In other words, God told us, has told us all we need to know. You ever take your kids, parents, you ever take your kids someplace that you know they're just going to love? Do you tell them about every single thing so when they get there they've already heard about it? Or do you say, uh, you're just not going to believe, this is gonna be, you're going to love this. When I was a kid, it was so awesome. And I'm not talking about a place that you say, oh, it's so awesome when you get there, it's terrible. I'm talking about it's, it's even better than you remember it. Okay? You, the first trip to Disneyland, I mean, kids, even the fair is fantastic for kids. I mean, they just love it. And so heaven's going to be so much more. And then the last one, Onyx Torres says this, and I love it. Make your priority reaching heaven through Jesus Christ, and everything else will be just fine. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for heaven. We thank you for it so much. Some people say that Christians are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. But I firmly believe it's exactly the opposite, Lord. That because we are heavenly minded, it makes us so much better citizens on earth. Because we know you're watching. We know that you are leading us. We know that you're teaching us. We know that you are telling us what's good behavior and what's bad behavior. And we are to do the things that are right and to not do the things that are bad. And when we sin, we need to confess it to you. And if there's restitution we need to make, we need to go and correct it with people. How in the world does that make us no earthly good? It makes us better citizens on earth. So we thank you for that. We thank you for this promise of what our eventual destination will be. With all this in mind, Lord, I pray that it would help us to be better citizens now in this meantime. Because on our headstone, it'll have a birth date and it'll have a date of death and there's that little dash in between. And that's where we are right now. And I pray that we would live in that dash the best way we can for you. So when that death date happens, we get to you and you look at us and you say, well done the good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. We don't deserve that, but we're so excited that we get it. We get to receive that, and we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.